Kia ora koutou, ko Hugh Taka Ingoa, he kaifaka ako, matua aho, ki manaki whenua. Ahi ahi marea, everybody, welcome to the last of our weedy webinar talks for this biosecurity bit, um, bonanza. And um, I, a lot of pleasure in actually introducing to you uh, Arno Cartier. So um, Arno and I have worked together for several years now. And um, Arno, um, thankfully for me, as much as anything, is uh, to be my successional replacement um, in the work that I've been doing um, around the organisation for the last 40 odd years. So um, uh, Arno's uh, going to talk to us about um, two of uh, the recent introductions that he's been working on, two of the insects for um, Old Man's Beard, uh, something that I started working on back in the 1990s, I think it was, and um, Arno's managed to pick up this work and carry it on in the near future. So um, welcome Arno, and um, I'll hand it over to you. Good stuff, thank you. Perfect. All right, thank you very much here for this very kind introduction. I'm very excited to be here, and um, it's a great pleasure to give you an update on the biological control programs done by Manaki Finua Land Care Research on Allman's Beard. This work was funded by the National Biocontrol Collective, Collective and by MPI through the Sustainable Food Fiber and Future Funds. So when I saw this presentation, I assumed that actually most of you know Old Man's Beard, um, it is considered as one of the worst terrestrial weed in New Zealand. It is an exotic plant that is native to Europe. Uh, it was sold as an ornamental in 1920s and it quickly escaped gardens. This is a climbing vine, it is producing very, very long stems and it can grow up to 10 meters per year. Because it grows so rapidly, it is forming those very dense, heavy masses that can dominate and smoother any type of vegetation of any height. Because of that, this weed is considered to be a huge threat to our environment. It quickly disperses using its fluffy seeds that you can see mostly in winter, and those seeds are being carried away by the wind and also floating downstream. This weed colonized disturbed and open forests, shrublands, riversides, bush tracks, and you can also see along roadsides, and mainly uh, found in urban areas if you are like me living in cities. It has now colonized almost all regions of New Zealand. So you can see here on this map that I had from iNaturalist that it is pretty much widespread. There are only few regions where it is still not uh, established. So for example, around Fjordland and Northland. And you can probably um, um, explain this uh, due to a slow down of its spread. For example, in Northland, where this weed is included in their regional pest management plan. So this regional council up there is working really hard to detect and destroy any new incursions before elements bill start to establish. It is now listed as an unwanted, unwanted organism under the Biosecurity Act. That means you cannot so sell it, you cannot propagate it, you cannot release Alderman's bill. The only way to work on that with is to get a proper authorization from MPI. And because it is such a weed, it is very expensive to control. Um, for example, Horizon Regional Council spends over $700,000 a year trying to control all men's beard. And the only way to do that so far is using manual removal or using broad herbicide. Obviously, broad herbicide are not great. They will target and kill all the plants nearby. So the only sustainable way to achieve control is using biological control. The biological control is based on a very simple thing. You have to try to restore the balance between a weed and its natural enemies. This is something that Manaki Fenua has been doing for a long time. Manaki Fenua is actually world leader 
in biological control program. As you were saying during the introduction, um, they have uh, worked on this with for the past 30 years, and I think they actually started to work before I was even born. <laughs> so the first agent that has um, been introduced is a leaf manning fly introduced in the late 90s. And you can see here the type of impact that the fly can have. It is actually the larvae. They are mining, mining the leaf and they are reducing the ability of the plant to photosynthesize. This agent established very quickly. It, it is now widespread and can be found all around New Zealand. Unfortunately, even though some outbreaks can be seen in the field, it is now kept under control by native parasitoids. A leaf fungus has also been introduced, but we believe it has died out and can't be found anymore. And there isn't much work that has been done until very recently to look for new pathogens. Along those years, a sawfly was also introduced. Um, this insect may look like a fly. It has the name of a fly, but it is in fact more closely related to wasps, bees, and ants. It is part of the Hymenoptera order. The sawflies were introduced in very low numbers uh, due to some difficulty to mass rear this insect in captivity. And this is mainly and I think it is actually the likely reason why it remained unnoticed until very recent surveys done in 2015. The other reasons um, we could um, uh, talk about uh, may be due to some very low genetic pool causing a bottleneck effect. There was also another insect that we've been looking at introducing. It is a bar beetle. Unfortunately, we had to reject this species because it was found to be non-specific and was attacking all native clematis. So for us, whenever an insect attacks all native plants, it is a no-go and we have to reject it. Much more recently, an areophyte mite has recently been approved for release. The establishment of the sawfly gave us hope that this agent could be reintroduced again. And you can see here that Linnea was really happy to find one larva in one of the sites near Nelson in 2015. And don't worry, you'll get your dose of very famous people during this presentation. Linnea is just the first of those. So since the reintroduction of the sawfly, uh, believed to be feasible, where well, that's what we decided to focus on. So we imported a new population from Serbia in 2018. Uh, because we do think that the sawfly remain unnoticed um, due to this bottleneck effect, um, we had to focus really hard on um, our mastering effort. The other unusual downside offering this species in captivity is its natural skewed sex ratio. In fact, it is um, showing a very biased male um, um, life. So usually we have much more males than females as adults, which makes things really hard to mass rear. So we spend an awful lot of time and effort to obtain and keep a more diverse genetic pool and a more balanced sex ratio that help us to end up with more females and ramp up the mass rearing. One of, one of the few things we also wanted to focus on um, was selecting a better release site, a site that could be closer to Lincoln, where we've been mastering the sofa, so we could monitor it um, more closely. You can see on that picture that the larvae are the damaging last stage. They are feeding on the leaves and they could actually defoliate entire plants in quarantine. The adults, they are not feeding on the, on the material. They don't do any damage. They only live for a few weeks and they mate and lay eggs. That's all they have to do. 
which is sometimes quite hard to find a mate in the field. So after selecting an ideal site um, in Umberley, close to Lincoln, we decided, in fact, to put all our eggs in one basket. So that's something that we are not used to do. We always say, oh, we better, you know, find a couple of sites. So if one crashes, we still have the other one. Well, in fact, we decided to do the exact opposite because we wanted really to boost the number of larvae being released at one site. And by the summer of 2018, 2019, Lindsay Smith and I were able to raise more than 2,000 larvae over there. Because that site was so close to us, it was also very handy to visit. So we were able to monitor this new release site and we were able to go many, many times every summer. And we quickly found that males, as you can see here, are able to be spotted fairly easily. They are flying nearby the release site and they are in fact looking for females. Those females are pretty hard to see. They usually hide below the leaves. However, it is a good confirmation that this new population has established in Canterbury. Even more encouraging, um, we were able to find larvae, as you can see on that picture below, we were able to find larvae um, and they are becoming much more common than they were a couple of years ago. And this past summer, I was even able to find fairly easily within a few hours more than 50 larvae per visit. And not only being able to find larvae, but also the feeding damage become much more obvious. And you can see here that the larvae are feeding on the leaves and you can see that pattern uh, fairly common now in that um, area where we release the sawflies. The sawflies are not very strong flyers. They tend to stay around the near the site. So it would be more appropriate for us uh, to collect a subpopulation and relocate it to new sites. And that's something that we'll be focused on in the future. If you remember just before, I was also talking about the area feed mites. The area feed mites are probably not very known, but they have a huge potential for use in biological control. They're part of a family of very, very tiny arthropods. They are measuring less than 200 microns. That's probably uh, the, the main reason why they have been poorly studied so far. However, they are known to be highly specific. Usually each species of aerophyte mites are frequently found to attack only one species of plant. And probably the best example we have here in New Zealand is the broom goldmite, which has been released in 20, uh, 2008 by Richard Hill and Hugh Gouley. Um, this um, broom goldmite is probably fairly common now in the New Zealand environment. It is forming those big lumps that we call goals, and it has a huge impact now on the New Zealand environment, it really reducing the um, the, um, the threat of broom in the field. The other advantage of these mites is their ability to grow through multiple generations a year. So we can really uh, easily um, master this species. They are also expected to spread fairly easily by using the air currents because they are so small, they can actually float in the air and this is a phenomenon that we um, call ballooning. So after the noticeable impact of the broom gold mite, we were obviously very interested to study a close related species believed to attack all man's beard. The work on um, this closely related um, species has started in 2011 when we first imported the species in containment. 
So 2011, that is to say that we started quite a long time ago, and it is also to reflect how long some of our biological control projects have been running for. Some of them have been even running for even much longer, 20 years or so. Uh, in fact, it became much more easier to carry the host testing in Serbia, where the mites are naturally found. This is their natural environment. So we decided to send some of our plants, test plants and native clematis to Serbia to make it easier for us to host test this species. Unlike the broom gold mites, this species of mite is not producing any golds, any big lumps. Instead, they are living inside the birds and they are sucking the sap and eating the embryonic leaves. This is resulting in producing very deformed and curled leaves, as you can see in the bottom picture. After showing um, that the mites were indeed very house specific and they were only able to attack the exotic clematis vitalba, so the olmans via that we have here and not targeting any native clematis, um, we applied to EPA, the Environmental Protection Authority, to release this mite, and it was granted in 2018. After a very labor-intensive process, um, we did manage to obtain the very first colony, uh, viable colony in containment in 2019. You have to remember here that these mites are very, very, very small. You can't even see them with the naked eye. So the only way to transfer them to onto New Zealand clematis plants was to use a pinhead under a microscope. And you had to focus really hard to get one mite on one pinhead and transfer it onto the New Zealand clematis plant. That was a very long and very labor intensive process. But we learned a lot uh, since that. And we realized that the best way to release this mite was to send infested plants uh, to be put it out in the field. It took us uh, some years to crack that rearing process, and we were finally able to produce enough material ready to be released nationwide last winter. <clears throat> So we were ready, we had everything lined up, we had cracked the room process, and we decided to send our first release to Horizon Regional Council to Craig Davis' team. Unfortunately, by the time we sent our plans to Craig, uh, a sharp lockdown was announced. Uh, so um, we were quite disappointed because we had all the media booked, we had also the EWIS that were part, that were supposed to be part of that release. So we had to postpone it, no choice, obviously, and we had to wait until the alert level drops. Fortunately, uh, weeks later, Craig Davy was able to do um, this release and um, it followed by other release in both islands where we were able to release in 14 different locations in both islands, including two sites in the contemporary region. So when I was telling you that you have your dose of very famous people, we have Terry and Leon here from Environment Contemporary who helped us with you to post out some of the infested plants we had booked for um, Ikan. And since then, um, we were able to go back to some of the release sites, and it was, in fact, very exciting to found that the mite had established two old release sites in the Canterbury. This triggered an extended search for new population and study the dispersal of those mites to sites that we have never visited before. So we started fairly closely around Lincoln and we found that they established they established over Port Hill. So we decided to extend that and we found them to have established as far as Springfield so far, which is more than 50 kilometers away from Lincoln, where we had our population of mites. So we decided to even extend it even further. So we went to Emberley and we fought the mites in Emberley fairly easily. I was like, oh, well, let's try to 
go further. And in fact, we even managed to find the mats that have established in Hamner Springs. It is 65 kilometers away from the closest population in Amber. That is to say how far those mites can disperse and spread easily. Uh, knowing that, um, I have a huge belief that um, the mites have also established in other regions where uh, we have raised them in either Marlborough, Horizons, Bay of Plenty. And in fact, I received um, some material from Horizon Regional Councils this week. And I can now confirm you that uh, the mites have also established over there. So now we have at least two confirmed population in both islands, which is obviously great news. So what's next now you like to think? Um, well, as I was telling you before, we want to collect a subpopulation of the SOFI so we could relocate them and um, for perhaps having two population in the in both islands that would be ideal really to get it um why to get it spread all over new zealand um we also want uh, to prepare uh, more mite releases for this coming spring and while it is still the early days for the recently established mite population we'll be monitoring closely the impact they may start to cause in the field and if it's still not enough, we are also subcontracting CABI in the UK to look for pathogens in Europe. Um, these surveys have just started over there, so it might still take a wee while before we can be sure that we have found a damaging pathogen that is host specific to Allemansville. But it is going to be very exciting again to have other agents um, for Allemansville. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And now I'm ready to hear about all your questions and answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Arno. That was very cool and, and well done. Um, the joy of being one of the old farts around the place is to realize that projects that you were working on in your earlier days were um, started and worked on before you were even born, which is just a <laughs> delightful thought, I have to say. But yeah, that's kind of like really cool. Um, so Arno, we've had a, a, a few comments or questions. Initially, one from Hester Williams saying, um, that was really impressive dispersal ability for the mite. Um, really impressed with that. Uh, Jazz Morris has written saying, a great talk, thank you. What is spreading the mites, do you think? Or how are they spreading around so far, do you think? Oh, um, I do believe that it's mainly wind. Wind dispersal uh, carried by the air movement, either the easterlies, southerlies, whatever wind you want to name, but mainly air movements and wind. Cool. Uh, <clears throat> Lindsay Vaughan has also asked, um, will releases go to all regional councils? Sorry, say that again. Oh, sorry. Uh, Lindsay Vaughan has asked, um, will releases of the mite go to all regional councils? Like, will all regional councils get releases of the mite? Uh, that would depend either all regional councils are interested to receive them. For example, Northland, I don't see any reason why they would want it since they don't have all men's bill present over there or in very low number, they would better try to eradicate it manually. Uh, and I do think that um, most of the regions would be interested to have a biocontrol agents released on Oldmansville in their region. So um, that would be interested to hear from all regional councils um, and the more the merrier, really. So we do those kind of releases as part of our cooperative program with regional councils, um, but there is a cost associated with a release to each region. So um, that's part of the arrangement that we have that our team does. Uh, Shane Hona has also written in and saying, he's asked, um, will you likely offer sawfly releases in the future? 
Um, I'll say likely yes, but depends what type of future uh, we are talking about. Um, next year, I have the funding to relocate them in a near, another nearby site. That would be a really good opportunity for us to learn more about the skewed sex ratio that is naturally occurring. And also being able to know more about this species would probably help us to master them in the future and offer them to regional councils. I don't think this will happen in the next reward, but probably in the three, four years, uh, next three, four years, I would like to think that, yes. Cool. Um, and Kate Goodall has asked, will the might be released? It's kind of a question you sort of already answered, but will the might be released through councils and will private landowners be able to get their own populations or highly for highly threatened sites? So yeah, that's basically the regional councils that um, decide where the mites go. Uh, if people are, for example, in Canterbury, it is on private land, but because it is so well infested by Oldman's view, they decided that this site was a really, really good site to select. Um, so if um, people from the public have a really huge infestation, I suggest them to get in touch with their regional council and then regional council get in touch with us to organize a release. Um, now the second part of this comment, uh, if people have their own population being established, the mites, I do believe the mites is going to spread to nearby plants. So then there is no much work to be done once they have established. We just need to see what type of impact they will have in the field. Cool, you know, quite true. It's certainly true that our team does not um, offer releases of our biocontrol agents to private individuals. We only work with um, DOC um, and other organisations and regional councils primarily. Uh, Liz, Lisa Stevenson has said, very exciting. Assuming the mites and sawfly get released and do their job, what happens then when old man, man's beard is gone? Will they adapt to eat other plants and become pests themselves? Mm. So that's a very common uh, comment that we have. Um, and that's why we are spending that many years to carry over the host testing. The host testing, it is here to ensure us that the insects we want to release are very host specific. And we usually do what we call um, exclusive hostess so when we put one insect on a native plant and we wait to see if it fits and usually the insect completely die because it cannot fit at all on our native if it does just like the bark beetles then we don't look at introducing this insect in the new zealand environment i don't believe um, and it's not, in fact, how biological control works, that we are going to eradicate all of man's beard out of the New Zealand environment. Biological control works in a way that we are restoring a balance between the weed and its natural enemies. So it would, if the insects are working really, really well, um, they will be able to reduce the growth of the plants so that all of man's beard won't be an issue anymore, it won't be a threat on our environment, but it's not going to eradicate the plant, really. It's not how biocontrol works. Cool, well done. Good answer there, Anna, well done. Um, Reese Burns has asked, why did you go to Serbia for each biocontrol agent? That is, what is so significant about Serbia and old man's beard? A few reasons here. Um, Serbia is one of the native area where Ottoman's beard is found and also the agents are found in Serbia. The other reasons um, um, that pushed us to go to Serbia is because we have collaborators over there, uh, Biliana, who is an uh, archaeologist and she is uh, in fact one of the world renowned archaeologist working on the mites and she already knew and did a lot of work for us uh, as a subcontractor so it was way more easier 
to ask someone who knew already uh, some of the information, how to rear this mite and how it spreads, rather than starting to look for other collaborators either in Switzerland, France, UK, etc. I hope it answers the question. Yep, no, that's great, thank you. Um, Simon Stevenson says, can we help spread the mites once they are established in our regions by moving plant material or does this need MPI approval? Mm, that's a really good question here. Um, you need to remember that um, indeed you do need a notarization from MPI to release um, ordinance beer. You cannot uh, move it without a proper authorization. Um, it is still possible to apply for such authorization. It is not that difficult in my opinion. But again, um, I do think the mites are going to spread fairly easily and it is more um, a matter of, I know it's hard to say, but maybe waiting to see a natural widespread and um, ballooning of the mites over the region. Otherwise, it is still possible to apply to MPI. And the question is here, do we know if the mites are surviving on cut material? Well, I'm not so sure about that. Um, that's what um, we tried in the very early days uh, to inoculate our New Zealand plants in containment. And we so far always failed to inoculate new plants using cut shoot material. That is one of the reasons why we decided to send infested plants to be potted out in the field. Cool. Um, Rima Huber has asked, is there anything that the public can do to contribute to the program in citizens science in a citizen science capacity? We have a local river care group working on old man's beard in the Waipara River, there could be interest to do some monitoring. Waipara River, yeah, that's exactly where um, both agents have been introduced actually. So um, there is iNaturalist that is a public um, website where people can report um, whatever they see. So for example, I use iNaturalist to monitor new ordinance beard infestation. That is very handy for me to know that, okay, I can go there. I know that ordinance beard is already present. As for the insect, it would be also good to engage with the public. So if they see um, the sawfly adults flying around an area where I've, I didn't know they were present, then that will, that will mean a lot for us to learn more about their dispersal. So I will, I will try to, I would like to see people uh, using iNaturalist more often. That is a very valuable information for us, really. Yep, true. We're always happy to hear as well from individuals um, and organisations and community groups if they do find our biocontrol agents in, in areas. And um, we're always happy to hear about the fact that they have found them. Um, it adds to our database um, of our releases and establishments and spread for the things that we do release out there. So it'd be cool. Um, Lindsay Vaughan has asked, this is a question you've probably already answered, but it won't do any harm to reiterate this, but Lindsay has asked, are we looking at long-term control or eradication? No, that's long-term control. We really look at biological control. So we are not looking at eradicating the plants. Um, uh, I think uh, probably a really good example of uh, bio control could be ragwort. Workwort used to be a very widespread, causing a lot of damage on, on the lands, on the environment. Um, we introduced, and Hugh was part of that, uh, we introduced agents that did manage to pretty much um, reduce by probably nearly 90, 95% uh, infestation of hardwood. Hagwood is still present in New Zealand, but in very low numbers. So that is to say that by a controlled try to really balance, as I was saying before, really balance um, the, uh, the weed with its natural enemy so that it doesn't become a weed anymore. And we won't have to work on eradicating this one because it will just be here and it won't cause any damage anymore. 
Cool. Um, probably our last question, but one's just popped up from Matt Short. Um, he's asked, what contributes to a successful establishment for these mites? What sort of time frame should we expect establishment um, to occur in or to fail? Um, I mm. arrived, sorry, he says, I arrived late to the webinar, so I'm sorry okay. if you have answered this already. <laughs> so yeah, no, that's cool. Mm. Yep. So in, in fact, they are so small and very hard to study that uh, there isn't much known on them. Uh, we know that um, when we tried uh, um, transferring cutted, cutting um, plants infested with the mice, it did fail. Um, and in fact, we wanted to really focus on making sure that the infested plants we were sending were able to root and and survive. Uh, so that's why we've been targeting um, around late winter, early spring to put out those infested plants in the field. Um, as for the question is, um, what is causing either success or establishment? Well, um, we're not quite sure, but obviously there are some predatory mites that could also feed on these area feed mites. And they are natural predators of area feed mites. So that could be a reason why they may fail to establish or even um, control, keep under control the area of the mites and we'll see how it goes in a few years time but they may in fact keep the entire area of the mites population under control just like what we saw before with the leaf miner uh, fly that is now kept under control by native parasitoids. So still a lot to learn here but um, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, there is still a lot to learn. True. Okay. Um, so Rima has asked again one last question. We've still got one after that actually from Lindsay, but <laughs> one last question. Can we expect these agents to cause significant damage to large plant or large established plants or large um, established plant populations? That's what we hope. That's what we expect. And that's what we see in fact, in containment when we mass rear those species. Um, it is obviously uh, when we mass rear those species under ideal conditions, we don't have any predators. Um, but if um, in the field those um, insects are not picked by natural predators, then we can totally expect to see large impact of these insects in large infestation. So yeah, that's the hope, that's the expectation. And the future will tell us if we are right or wrong to expect this type of damage. Yep, true, dead right. Fingers crossed that, you know. Mm. Um, Lindsay Vaughan has uh, just asked another one. Um, he's asked about the distribution of digital and printed information to interested parties. I guess there's a question, do we do that? Or is there a plan to do that kind of thing? Uh, so for the distribution on the spread, um, as you were saying here before, we are happy to hear from people and we usually um, want the regional councils to monitor the release site. Um, it will be way easier with the SOFI because they are easy to spot, so much more difficult with the mites. And that's why I have started to welcome some of the material nearby the release site to be sent to me so I could do some dissections under the microscope. So having some information nearby the release site would obviously be welcome. And that's probably how regional councils can help great deal with that. Yep, and I think um, Lindsay might be sort of asking is, do we disseminate digital information and, and printed information? And <clears throat> so we do to regional councils um, to some degree, and that's tends to, um, through our printed um, uh, magazine type information that we have. But our public website carries all of the information about all of our weeds um, and all of our biocontrol agents. So. Um, primarily for accessing the 
the research information about our biocontrol agents, you need to go to our public website to find that. Yeah, thank you. I cool. understand now that I... Yeah, no, that's cool. Really you answered it as well. <laughs> it's not a different way. No, that's cool. Thank you. Look, I think I think that's about it now. Thank you very much. And that was quite a few questions and um, a lot of really interesting people um, about Old Man's Beard. It's certainly one of New Zealand's worst environmental weeds that we that we are faced with. And it's really cool to see that the work that you've been doing is uh, is leading to, um, to a uh, potential um, control, levels of control for this. So um, so that's really cool. Thank you very much, Arno, and thank you to everybody for thank attending. You. And um, that'll be it for today. So um, thanks a lot, everybody.